Plus, we are continuing our series of the Refiner's Fire with the ministry of T. Austin Sparks. Today we're going to be talking about an open heaven. Whenever things are in danger of departing from his full, his complete thought, God will always seek to bring back a fresh revelation of his Son. It will not lead to the recapture of truths as such, will bring back all that is necessary by a fresh revelation of his son, an unveiling or presentation of his son in fullness. The New Testament church was departing from its primal and pristine glory and purity and truth and holiness and spirituality and becoming an earthly Christian system. The Lord's way of meeting that situation was through these writings, which are a new presentation of his son in heavenly, divine spiritual fullness it is coming back to Christ and the Holy Spirit would do that all the time he would bring us back to the person to show us what that person represents in a spiritual and heavenly way we must be very careful that in our passing on from the Gospels to the epistles we do not get even unconsciously into the position that we have that is that the epistles are something very much in advance of the Gospels. All that is in the epistles is there in the Gospels. But the epistles are simply the interpretation of Christ and the Lord would never have us occupied with the interpretation to the loss of the person. We take the Acts and the epistles as setting forth the technique of the church and the churches and adopt it as a crystallized system of practice, order, form, teaching and the weakness in the whole position is just this that that is something as in itself and the Lord Jesus has been missed and lost we can make out of the epistles a hundred different earthly systems all built upon the epistles they will be made to support any number of different systems different interpretations represented by Christian orders here and the reason is that they have been divorced from that person so certain people hive off around a sanctification teaching and they are the sanctificationists and it becomes an ism. Others hive off and they are bounded by the hedge of second adventism, the Lord's coming, prophecy, and all that. So you get groups like that. I want you to say that would be utterly impossible that the person of the Lord Jesus was dominant. What is the kingdom of God? It is Christ. If you get right inside of the Gospels, you will find that the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. The kingdom is not something in the first place. The kingdom, when it becomes something universal, will simply be the expression and manifestation of Christ. That is all. You come to the kingdom in and through Christ, and the same is true of everything else. What is sanctification? It is not a doctrine. It is not an it at all it is Christ he has made unto us sanctification 1st Corinthians 1 30 if you are in Christ and if the Holy Spirit is teaching you Christ then you are knowing all about sanctification and if he is not you may have a theory and doctrine of sanctification but it will separate you from other Christians and it will be bringing any number of Christians into difficulties Probably the teaching of sanctification as a thing has brought more Christians into difficulty than any other particular doctrine through making it a thing instead of keeping Christ as our sanctification. Whereas the Holy Spirit is not teaching us things, not church doctrine, not sanctification, not Adventism, not anything or any number of things, but teaching us Christ. What is Adventism? What is the coming of the Lord? Well, it is the coming of the Lord. And what is the coming of the Lord? Well, such a word as this will give us the key. He shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all them that believed. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 You see, it is the consummation of something that has been going on in an inward way. How then do I best know that the coming of the Lord draws nigh? Not best of all by prophetical signs, by what is going on within the hearts of the Lord's people. 
That is the best sign of the times, namely what the Spirit of God is doing in the people of God. But maybe you are not interested in that. You would far sooner know what is going to happen between Germany and Russia, whether these two eventually are going to become a great confederacy. How far does it get us? Where has all the talking about the revived Roman Empire got us? That is Adventism as a thing. If only we keep close to him who is the sum of all truth and move with him and learn him, we shall know the course of things. We shall know what is imminent. We shall have in our heart whisperings of preparation. The best Advent preparation is to know the Lord. I am not saying that there is nothing in prophecy. Don't misunderstand me. But I do know that there are multitudes of people who are simply engrossed in prophecy as a thing whose spiritual lives count for nothing, who really have no deep inward walk with the Lord. I shall never forget on a visit to a certain country going into one of the big cities where I was to speak for a week. Everything was so arranged that my first message was time to follow the last message of a man who had a week before me, and he had been on prophecy for the whole week. I went into the last meeting where he gave his final message on the signs of the time. Notebooks were out, and they were taking it all down, fascinated. It was all external, all objective, such things as the Roman Empire revived and Palestine recovered. You know the son of this sort of thing. Then he finished... And they were waiting for some more in the heart that the first word was to be. And everyone that hath this hope said on him, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. 1 John 3, 3. To speak of the spiritual effect of the spiritual hope, they were not interested in that. The notebooks were closed, pencils put away. There was no interest, so I sought in the Lord to be very faithful as to what all this should mean in an inward way, in adjustment to the Lord, and so on. They were only longing for the meeting to close. When I finished, they hardly waited for me to finish. They were up and out. Oh no, it is the Lord and the Holy Spirit would bring us back to the Lord. And it is not, after all, coming back to non-essentials, to elementary things, to come back to Christ. It is coming on to the only basis upon which the Holy Spirit can really accomplish all God's will and purpose. The breaking of the self-life. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. That put alongside the final words, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, gives us a complete picture of what spiritually lies behind. At the time when Jacob and Guile, you remember the story of his Guile, stole the birthright and had to escape for his life, he saw a very great truth. Though but dimly, as in type or figure, and a truth moreover into which was not then able to enter, Jacob at that time could never have entered into the meaning of what he saw, namely the house of God. Bethel, that place where heaven and earth meet, God and man meet, where the glory, uniting heaven and earth, God and man, is the great link where God speaks and makes himself known, where God's purposes are revealed. Why was this the case with Jacob? He was in guile. Let him leave it there then, as he must, and go on and for twenty years come under discipline, and at the end of twenty years, discipline meet the impact of heaven upon his earthly life, his earthly nature, the impact of the Spirit upon his flesh, the impact of God upon himself at Jabbok. And let that fleshly natural life be smitten and broken and withered to bear the mark of the rest of his days of its having come under the ban of God. And then, with the Jacob judged, the Jacob smitten, Wounded, withered, he can go back and pour out his drink offering at Bethel and abide. Guile is dealt with. It was not Jacob, but Israel, in whom, speaking in type and figure, there is no guile. 
The work was not finished, but a crisis was met. The Lord Jesus is saying here to put it in the word, just this. To come into the place of the open heaven where for you God is coming down in communication and the glory of God abides. And where you enjoy what Bethel means is nothing else than to come into me. And to come into me and abide in me as the Bethel, the house of God, and have all the good of heaven and that God communicated means you have come to the place where the natural life has been laid low, broken, withered. It is necessary for the Lord to say to us in Christ as we come to the very threshold of that door, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no Jacob. You shall see the heaven opened. To speak of the Jacob life is, after all, only another way of saying the self-life, for self is the very essence of the natural life, not just the self-life in its most positive evil forms, but the self-life in its totality. Jacob was in the elect line. He had a knowledge of God historically, but the transition from the natural to the spiritual was through discipline and crisis. You and I must not think of the self-life only as the something manifestly corrupt. There is a great deal done for God with the purest motive that is done out from ourselves. There are many thoughts, ideas, judgments which are sublime, beautiful, but they are ours. And if we did not know the truth, they are altogether different from God's. And so, right at the very door of his school, the Lord puts something utter. It is Jabbok. Jabbok was a tributary of the Jordan. The implications of Jordan are right there at the very threshold of the school of Christ. It will only be as the Jacob nature is smitten. I'm not talking to you mere doctrine and technique. Believe me, I know exactly what I am talking about. I know this thing is the greatest reality in my history. I know what it is to have been laboring with all my might for God and preaching the gospel out from myself for years. Oh, I know. I know what hard labor it is with the dome over your head. How many times have I stood in the pulpit and in my heart have said, If only somehow or other I could get a cleavage through this dome over my head. And instead of preaching what I have gathered from books and put into my notebooks and having to study it up, I could scrap the whole thing and with an open heaven speak out what God is saying in my heart. That was a longing for years. I sensed there was something like this, but I had not got it until the great crisis of Romans 6 came and with it the open heaven. It has been different ever since then, altogether different. We shall see the heaven opened, and all that strain is gone, all that bondage is gone, that limitation, there is no dome there. Until the Jacob life has been dealt with, through that crisis, and the Lord is able to say, An Israelite indeed, in whom is no Jacob, thou shalt see heaven opened. There is that dome, that closed heaven over us by nature. But blessed be God, the cross rends the heavens, the veil is rent from top to bottom, and Christ is revealed through the rent veil of his flesh. He is no longer seen as the man Jesus, he is seen in our hearts and all the fullness of God's consummate thought for man. It is a tremendous thing to see the Lord Jesus. And it is a tremendous thing to go on seeing him more and more. That is where it begins. Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile, no Jacob. Thou shalt see heaven opened. A new prospect for a new man. That word, thou shalt see heaven opened, is the new prospect for a new man. A new man, a new prospect. By the coming of the Holy Spirit, the open heaven is made a reality. The cross affects the opening of the heavens for us, but it is the Holy Spirit who makes it good in us. Just as was the case in that typical or symbolic death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus in Jordan, when the heavens were open to him, coming up on new, resurrection ground, he had the open heaven. The Spirit then alighted and abode upon him. And the Spirit became, shall we say, 
the channel of communication, making the open heaven all that it should be as a matter of communication, intercourse, communion. It is the error of the Spirit making all the values of Christ real in us. That error has come. We are in the error of the Holy Spirit, in the open heaven. The mark of a life anointed by the Holy Spirit. What then is the mark of a life anointed by the Holy Spirit? The mark of a life anointed by the Holy Spirit is that you know Christ in this living and ever-growing way. Oh, it is not doctrines and truths and themes and subjects and scriptures as mere matter that I need to know. It is all very wonderful when you are taken up with it. But let a man come into the fires, into deep trial, into trouble and perplexity, and then what about all your doctrines and all your themes and all your Bible study? What is the value of it? It does not really solve your problem. It does not get you through. This is a tragedy. It is true of many of us who have got certain doctrines, who have gone through the doctrines of the Bible and worked them out and who know what is in the Bible on these things, regeneration, redemption, atonement, righteousness by faith, sanctification, and so on. It is true that after we have gone through them all and have got them all well worked out and we come into a terrible spiritual experience, the whole thing counts for nothing. We come to the place where, but for the Lord, we could easily throw the whole thing over and say, this Christianity does not work. Yes, for those who have known the Lord for years, so far as the accumulation of truth is concerned, that is about the value of it in an hour of the deepest spiritual distress. The only thing then that can help you is your beautiful notebooks full of doctrines. But rather, what do I know of the Lord personally and livingly in my own heart? What has the Holy Spirit revealed in me and to me and made a part of me, of Christ? Sooner or later, that is where you are coming to. We are going to be brought back to the living spiritual knowledge of the Lord. For He alone personally, as revealed in our very being by the Holy Ghost, can save us in the deepest hour. The day will come when we will be stripped of everything but what is spiritually, inwardly known of Christ, stripped of all our mental and intellectual knowledge. Many of those who have been giants in teaching and in doctrine have had a very, very dark hour at the end of their lives, a very dark hour indeed. How they have got through has depended upon the inward knowledge of the Lord as over against mere intellectual knowledge. How can I explain what I mean by that? The Holy Spirit has come to make for us an altogether new order of things so that Christ is being revealed in us as our very life. Ye shall see when the Spirit comes. That is the mark of an anointed life. Ye shall see. Let no one think that this open heaven, this anointing, is for a certain few. Oh no, it is for everyone. God's desire, God's thought, is that you and I, the most simple, foolish, weak amongst men, the most limited naturally, with the least capacity naturally, should find that our very birthright is an open heaven. In other words, you and I may, in Christ, know this wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, and an inward revelation of Christ in ever-growing fullness. Thanks for joining us. Check us out online, crossculturenm.weebly.com. Follow us on Twitter, and like and share our Facebook page, Cross Culture NM. Next time we'll be covering the urgency and necessity for a life in the fullness of the Spirit.